Hi, I'm Bruce. I'm the fittest fat kid you know. And this is week two, the first full week back on program, ideally back on track. And this week there have been failures, there have been successes, and we'll get into that. But before we do, I need to bring in Randy. Randy, how you doing? What's up, Bruce? Uh, as you know, it's Monday, it's the start of the week, and it's day eight. How about yourself? <laughs> I will never do keto. I envy your ability to do it. And uh, I think if anybody's qualified to comment on it, it's probably you. So good on you. And we're going to get into that. But first, let's talk about the week. So this week, as I said, there were failures and successes to start the failures, because the failures are not nearly as important as the successes. My goal last week was I was going to walk three times during the week for three miles. I was going to work out for three days. And while I think a couple days I actually got three miles worth of walking, I didn't specifically go out and walk for a three mile stretch. That didn't happen. The other thing that didn't happen is I didn't work out much this week at all. And, and those were things I had wanted to do and weren't able to do. However, on the success side, first off, today's weigh-in. I went from last week at the start of this weighing 258.4 pounds to today weighing 247 pounds flat. Nice. Nice first week. Now, of course, bearing in mind, most of that is water weight. Probably maybe two or three pounds are actual fat loss. Yeah. But but no, that's it's it's part of the process. Sure, sure. Other successes, as um, I had mentioned that I wanted to go back onto keto. I've stuck, went on to and absolutely stuck to my keto diet. Not only that, I'd mentioned as an extended goal for a couple weeks in the future to reintroduce my intermittent fasting window. That happened accidentally. Almost every day this week, I effectively ate within a six hour window. Not intentionally, it just occurred. So there's a success. I've, I discovered that I didn't lose all of my push-ups. Now, granted at the top, I could do 50 push-ups, but in a little working out I did, I was able to get um, a couple sets of 13 in a row, which while not, spectacular we're talking weighing over 250 pounds i would and having not done them in a while i was able to get a couple sets of 13 so i'm um, pretty happy about that that was how this week went so not so bad not so bad pretty happy with it okay i am doing keto and one of the things about keto is you need to adapt to it it doesn't you don't just hey, I'm now going to stop eating carbs and suddenly you're on track. It takes a few weeks for your body to fully utilize. So for the first couple days, certainly the first day, which not only did I just stop eating almost all carbs that day, I also didn't go to bed till five in the morning the next day getting this podcast ready. Hmm. If you stop eating carbs, it takes about 48 hours for your body to start producing ketones. But just because your body's producing ketones, it doesn't mean your body's using ketones. That can take anywhere from one to two weeks. They usually call it the keto flu because you feel run down, you have no energy, and you just want to lay there and let the feeling pass. It just, it's hard to focus, you're in a fog, because your brain isn't getting the energy it's used to getting. That only began passing for me I adapt quickly, but even adapting quickly, it took six days before I started feeling a normal degree of energy. Would it be worthwhile at this point to talk a little bit about what ketones are so people don't just keep hearing ketones, ketones, and it gets to be like, you know, what you say to your cat versus what your cat hears? Your body can run off two kinds of fuels. Either it's running off of glucose or it runs off of fat. Oftentimes in the form, when we say ketones, it is a fatty acid called beta-hydroxybutyrate. There are a couple other fatty acids as well, but that's, that's the main they, one. T that's where your body turns fat into to run off of it? Yeah, so your body, you stop taking in carbs. And at first, and your body cannot store that much in the way of glucose. You have about 
at any given time stored about 400 calories worth within your muscles? Well, it'll store about 20 miles worth of glycogen in your liver, which is when marathoners hit the wall. You run 20 miles, you hit the wall, and your liver glycogen's used up. So when your body is deprived of this energy source, after a while, it realizes it's not getting there. It's, it's going to be a while before it can get any get more. So it starts con, your liver starts converting the fat in your body into fatty free fatty acids, the beta hydroxybutyrate, hmm. which is a ketone. And most of your cells can burn that as opposed to glucose. But it has to effectively throw a switch to do it. It does one or the other. It doesn't do both. So it takes a certain amount of pressure from the lack of carbs before your body's forced to make the change. And that's where this keto flu that you're talking about comes from. Yes, because your body hasn't made that change. Okay. Let's cover one other thing with keto, which is the use of exogenous ketones. And exogenous, that means external. I know because I looked it up. What a scholar. I know. I am so smartish. So... <laughs> The idea, and you see these ads all over the place. Get on to the latest diet. You can lose a ton of weight. You don't have to exercise. You don't have to diet. You don't have to do anything but drink this $5 drink. And this will make you make the fat better off. In 30 days, you will go from weighing 280 pounds to 160 pounds in a bikini. Bullshit. Exogenous ketones literally are a drink or a food, but it's usually, I think it's almost always a drink that you drink and it puts ketones into your body. And then if you were to test your blood, oh my God, you're in ketosis. The trick to ketosis isn't the, the, the producing these things. It's the utilizing them. It's the burning them. You can't, it doesn't matter how many exogenous ketones you take. If you've eaten a pizza, I mean, or just a slice of bread or an apple, if your body isn't getting below that threshold and it's and you your body feels the need to convert to burning the fat these you're just peeing the you just pee them out your body can't utilize yeah, them so if you don't arrive at the ketones by cutting carbs they're worthless to you yes and even if once you're there they're not valuable to you anyway your body's producing them regardless it doesn't help you it's a fad. It, it, it's, it's yet another in a long line of effective snake oil leveraging on your hope and your desire, trying to make it easy for you. And while I don't think it necessarily is hard if you do it correctly, there are no real shortcuts and certainly not exogenous ketones. If you're going to try to do the diet, don't drink something, just stick to your macros. So here's the, here's the basic bare bone structure of, I, I want to try keto. Here's how you do it. It is high fat, moderate protein, low carbs. And that means at the start, 20 carbs, 20 grams of carbs or less per day. At some point, I will start saying the word grams again. I promise everyone. And you do that for a few weeks to maybe about a month, at which point you get yourself into ketosis. You, you know, you can feel that you're feeling good. Things are going well. Ideally, you're getting some kind of metric. You're testing your blood and you're within the range of where you know you're in ketosis, which is 0.5 millimole to above. 0.5 is the bare minimum. At 0.4, you're not really in ketosis, even though you're producing some ketones. At 0.5 and above, you're in nutritional ketosis. You can up the amount of grams of carbs you're taking in. Is it good to decide, I'm going to have like 40, 25 of those is going to be a Snickers bar? No. But you can start adjusting up to see where you start coming, where you're start coming out of ketosis and just kind of, you know, fine tune to see where, what you're comfortable with, what makes you happy. I tend to stick really low because that's how I work well. I just try to, I just try to hit my 20 
And if I do that, I know that even if I miss that target, I'm still good. So I don't have to think much beyond, you know, I'm hitting this low, I'm good. I did get a very lovely note from a listener and a friend. So this was very nice. Um, I just finished the first episode. It's fantastic, man. Really, really great. Engaging, relatable for every fitness journey, entertaining. Count me a man. Here's the important part. That was all that was all like fluffing me, which thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. it touched me. It's crazy how life works. For the past year, I've gone in and out of my fitness. Pre-pandemic, I was rocking it. In the stage I wanted to be. Pandemic hit, and I could never commit to getting back there. I've been getting the ice cream and chocolates at night. Wouldn't give a crap about portion size. All in all, this last Monday, I said, screw it. I need to get serious about it, and I need to be sticking to it. It being his fitness, of course. And along comes your podcast. I'll be listening every week. It helps me to not get lost on my journey. So that was, that was very, very nice, very touching. So I know that there is one person out there who <laughs> this is helping. Yeah, good. So you're having the desired effect. This podcast is about my fitness journey and how my fitness journey relates to other people's fitness journey, you, the listener, whoever you are, and hopefully you're gleaning something from this podcast that is helping you, or at the very least, not frightening you. So this week, or that is to say, last week, which was the week of October 11th, something, a little something occurred that I find, that I found interesting. Now, I'm not a person who follows celebrities. I'm, I have difficulty even recognizing celebrity. But around Wednesday of last week, which would have been the 13th, Jonah Hill took to his Instagram and requested of his followers to stop commenting on his physical appearance. This is something that I found very interesting because... As somebody who has been heavy throughout all of his, most of his life, or certainly had ups and downs, in society, people just feel free to comment on your physical appearance, specifically your weight, without regard to um, etiquette or... As if you didn't know. As if I didn't know that I'm wearing a double X shirt, as if that slipped my mind, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on Jonah Hill's physical appearance. I wouldn't have done it anyway. But here is somebody who is a public figure. He has been in movies. He has been in TV shows, I assume, but definitely movies. He is a celebrity. And he has gone through various stages of weight loss journey. He's gained, he's lost. And I'm sure that it's not been easy or pleasant for him. I don't know that. I've never met the man. I've never spoken to him. But I've seen my journey in his. There's a lot of parallels between what we've gone through. So I know that if for me, who is mostly an average guy on the street. I've done some, you know, videos. So, so here's an example of something that happened to me, how invasive this can be. 10 years ago, I decided to produce my first um, thing, first videos. And it was this comedy series called Under the Doghouse. You were in it. You were in one of the episodes. I recall. Somebody watched one of the episodes, and in the episode, I was going on a date with a girl, and another girl interrupted that date who was a friend. Somebody wrote a comment on YouTube. It's not there anymore, uh, because the channel's not there anymore that it was at. And also, I deleted the comment, because at the time, I couldn't really um, deal with it in the correct manner. The YouTube comment was so long that when I cut it and I pasted it into a Word document, it was like three pages long. I am not exaggerating about that. 
The comment was all about how the lead is too fat to be a lead. He would never have girls like that. Girls that cute would not be interested in him. And then he proceeded to write a fitness program with complete diet that was completely detailed. It actually wasn't <laughs> that. In fairness. You never told me this. Like, I You've never told me this I, before. I didn't tell anybody. It. At the time, it upset me. It bothered me. Here's this. I spent. Don't doubt it. Yeah. I spent tons of money, wrote this thing, slaved over this thing. And, and what did somebody say? You're too fat to kiss a girl who looks like that. He clearly isn't familiar with your dating profile. I mean, I happen to know that you've kissed more than one girl. Why, thank you. And they were willing. Thank you, girls. Thank you. Why you became an actor, let's face it. The truth is, I began getting into acting to overcome crippling shyness. But I don't want to get into that now because we're on a different topic. We will talk about my crippling shyness later. Mission accomplished. So after all of this work, um, a couple good jobs, but a three word page document diatribe filled with what I should be doing eating, how I should be working out, what this and what that. And when I saw it, I was horrified and I, I, I deleted it. I, I really wish I kept it. I've met Jehovah's Witness, Witnesses that don't have that much missionary zeal to write a three-page document uh, helping you. And it was in a YouTube comment. It wasn't that he sent me an email. It was a YouTube comment. Later on, Dark Spectre 2. So here's my... My other thing, and I'm, have, I'm dressed in a supervillain costume. I'm having a fight in the middle of a street with another super. There's VFX for something paid out of my pocket, a fairly nice budgeted thing. I thought done really well. The comment that was posted, and it's still there on the Dark Spectre page, like somewhere further down. Somebody saw this video and just went on a rant about how the costume made the lead look fat. Now, this was years later. So what I did in that instance is I responded to this person by going, to be clear, it isn't the costume that's making me look fat. It's the fact I weigh 250 pounds. Don't put that on the costume designer. Now, that person got really, really contrite really quick. The point being, I didn't put out any of these things as a fitness thing. Right now, this, what I'm doing now, this kind of puts me out front and for somebody to evaluate, like somebody making a comment on how fat or how fit or how this or that, I put this out there. I'm putting this out there in that realm for those reasons, partially to show, to show how people get affected by these things and how you can deal with them and what are some survival strategies. Because it's really hard for somebody who struggles with their weight because you always feel that somebody's looking at you, you always feel somebody's walking down the street and they're judging you. Now, mostly they are not. People are not involved in your life. They're involved in theirs. And if they see you, it's because their eyes crossed their path. But there's this small nagging voice for me and for a lot of people that I know who battled with their weight, that somebody is always judging you. However, there are people out there who do judge you and they feel free to do that. It's the same kind of like, oh, like with a lady who might have a bump, like, oh, are you having a baby? Can I touch it? It's just this invasive mm. permission that they feel that they have. And it can be really psychologically damaging because it's, it, it sucks to feel that the world is looking down upon you just because of the shape of your body. It has nothing to do with the quality of your personality. The, the your level of skills the the value you bring to humanity none of that matters you're a little pudgy and you know what else it is too is uh you're not playing the funny fat guy role you're not you know doing ralphie may where uh a lot of your act is fat jokes you're not oliver hardy you're not a guy who's uh who's making hay out of uh like, hey, look, I'm chubby, but I still have a life and I uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever, whatever that role is, you're, you're saying, hey, look, uh, I'm not even going to deal with my physical uh, self. I'm just going to do what I do and uh, and be what I am. And, and I'm not even going to comment on it. I'm just going to I'm going to dare to be a superhero, get the girl, uh, 
do this, do that, uh, without asking permission or without, you know, asking to qualify as a matinee idol before I dare to take on that role. Very little of the things I've ever written or put out there are built around the idea of weight. Just like one of the things that I, there are people who as, you know, just like this, this is about my, this is about my physical health and well-being. And this is about other people's physical health and well-being. So this is being put out there for that. Anything else was not there. Being so when Jonah Hill, who has his ups and downs, just like so many people, his body of work is not related to his body. He did not get into what he was doing as some kind of statement on his physical presence. It was not his none of his work warrants it. None of his work invites it. Just the fact that he he's is a performer, there. he's an actor, he's, yeah. he's there to do his work. He's not there to invite your commentary. And it's like, and you can take it outside of the, the acting realm. So one of the reasons I've always felt a pressure to lose weight is I keep trying to do things that require a greater buy-in from, some, from somebody, a greater belief in me. Now, I have a lot of confidence about my skills and abilities. I present them that way. I present well. But I know that when I walk into the room, the first thing they see is how I look. It's my body. They're going to they're they're going to judge, they're going to prejudge a lot about me just because I'm looking this way. Now, that is an incredibly poor metric to judge somebody from because just because somebody might one might be happy with the way their body is they may be very pleased or they might have struggles or they might have a medical condition there's a entire world of reasons somebody can be the way they are that has that is just c- completely hidden from you and to be perfectly honest not your business for that to be th- and then they judge and they start making assumptions on you based on that and because being heavy is a pejorative that's an impression they have of you. Which does, let us know, give you the element of surprise. It does, but it also gives me a hill to climb up against. There are a lot of people out there who don't want to reach out to friends because, or, or they don't want to be seen or don't want, they don't want to. One of the things that I felt specifically with this weight gain is I didn't want to reach out to somebody because I didn't want to impose the hideousness that is me on them. Now, is this a great example? And I'm actually going to like talk to him about it is I have a friend who was my primary workout partner for the past couple of years. Then COVID happened and we all shut down. We haven't seen each other in a while. When I gained weight, I was embarrassed. I did not want to reach out to him. I didn't want him to know because now there's a reality of what would happen. And I, if I reached, if I had reached out to him, the only thing out of his mouth would have been like, all right, what do we do? What do you need me to do? Like, like I am there. Like we can arrange a workout. We can do these things. Do you want to just like text me? Like if you can't get motivated, that's all he would have done. Like no judgment, no nothing. It's like you fell a little bit. We acknowledge that you've climbed the mountain before. We know you can do it. What do we need to do? That's all he was going to do. But that's what and you never punch the mic. It's a bad idea. That's what my brain knew. That is what happened. What did I, what did I feel? What did my, what did my fear? What did my heart? What did, what did the 11 year old who was bullied because he was fat and the kids and mothers in the neighborhood would make their kids feel good by making fun of him. He thought like he felt this, uh, the 11 year old, the, the feeling part, the id, this, like he was going to be disgusted. He was going to just be disappointed. He was going to hate. And none of that's true. The brain knew it. But it took 
this friend reaching out to me for me to go like, I have to respond. Otherwise, I wouldn't. And that's because of the way society keeps feeling the right to just simply judge by appearance without if ever giving thought that, have you been invited for this opinion? I wanted, to, I wanted to bring this up because there's a lot of people who will hear this, who feel judged and feel that people just feel free to, to, to step on them. And those people are wrong. They shouldn't do that. And they shouldn't, have, they shouldn't even feel the right to do that because they don't have a right to do that. But if you haven't reached out to somebody or haven't done something because of the way you feel about the way you look, I want to heavily encourage you to stop thinking along those lines. Sometimes, especially when the pandemic hit and you've put on weight, and now there are friends and places you want to, that you wanted to go and, and you won't, go anyway. I, at one point of my life, I, this week, didn't work out too much, but what working out I did, I got 13 push-ups. That's, that, that's, that was a miracle. I expected under six. But. 13 more than you did the day before. 13 more than I did the day before. But if I do 13, to, if I do 13 today and I do 13 tomorrow, and I do a couple, I start doing a couple sets, in a week or two, it'll be 20. As long as I go, oh my God, I, I shouldn't do this. It'll never be more than me sitting here feeling bad about myself. I just want to encourage people to, you know, if somebody is crossing a barrier with you, do not be, do not feel afraid to put a boundary. Do not be afraid to make people respect your boundaries. You are not doing anything hurtful, wrong by saying to somebody, Here's a line. Don't cross it. So if there is somebody in your life who likes to talk about your weight and they're not welcome, tell them. Be polite, be respectful, but also be direct. Don't do this to me anymore. You have every right to be treated the way you want to be treated. And you have every right to not accept people not treating you that way. Absolutely. And understand when you judge others by appearance uh, that you may be about to get your butt kicked by that person. I used to tell new athletes in my gym, you know, at Parkside CrossFit all the time, you don't be surprised if you get outrun by big guys, outlifted by little guys and beat by girls. Uh, and people who don't necessarily have a six pack are, are going to be beating you at stuff because all the time you've been working about having working on having veins in your teeth, they've been working on performance. Yeah, and uh, I remember a time when you you choked out uh, uh, the fastest guy at, at the gym we were training at. Uh, I think because he didn't see you coming, but uh, he, even if he did, he didn't. You know, yeah, that was that was that was fun. I still I still have that picture. It still warms the cockles of my heart. Um, I yeah. know you do. That's why I brought it up. But uh, yeah, you, you, you don't want to you don't want to make any assumptions uh, based on appearance. Uh, I used to, God, I remember you know rolling at, at Gene LaBelle's class over at L.A. College, and this fifteen year old brown belt who might have been a national champion for all I know, who I outweighed by forty pounds, used to dribble me around like a basketball. It was infuriating, and and the other grown ups would make fun of me like this big Aussie, who I think was second in the country. In his age group, he used to go, come on, Randy, he's just a kid, mate. And I just, and the matter I got, of course, the worse I get beat. Uh, you know, you got, got to stay calm and you can't make any assumptions uh, in life and in your program and, and in everybody's program. You just got to relax and forge ahead and not let the idiots get you down. You know, boundaries is a good thing to bring up especially in this day and age where everybody's watching you, everybody's recording you, everybody feels free to comment. The heck with those guys. You don't need that input. Just uh, get them out of your life and, and live your life for you. Yes. So wherever you are on your journey, if you have 
anyone who is commenting on you, judge you, put the boundary, and if they won't respect it, you don't need that person in your life. That said, my goals for the next week is to finally get those three days of working out, get those three, not just three miles in the day. I'm going to do that just running the errands and trying to fix things around here. A dedicated walk of three miles. Continue on my ketosis, just, um, just eating keto, continue on the diet as it is. And reporting back to you guys in a week. Anyway, Randy, where can they find you? Oh, they can find me at the Conway Rec Center uh, teaching uh, what they're calling high intensity, um, HIC high intensity circuit training. Uh, it's CrossFit, but we can't call it that. It's uh, circuit training until we come up with another name for it. They can also find me on uh, medium.com writing under the name Scrotus the Wise. And there's actually an article in there called The One About Fat, which uh, presents my point of view on the whole subject. This has been the fittest fat kid you know. You can find us everywhere you find your favorite podcast. You can find us on YouTube. Please like, subscribe, leave us a comment. Every little bit helps. And please, if there's somebody in your life you know that could benefit from discussions like this, send them our way. We would also love to hear from you. So email us, write us, let us know where you're at in your fitness journey. If you have questions, if there's anything we can do to help, we're here for you.